I'm Rick Johansson, and this is the Iron Echo Design Channel. Welcome to the Inkscape Quick Start Guide. This is the unauthorized version because I'm gonna go through the tools, the basics, and show you how to get started with Inkscape on day one quickly as if I was teaching my own dad. The Inkscape is a vector-based graphic software program that competes with the likes of Adobe Illustrator, except it's free. And here's some examples of things you can do with it. These are all from previous tutorials on this channel, except this whale. And there's no prerequisite. All you have to do is download it. I'll have the link in the description of how to do that. If you need help with the download, just put a comment down below. But let's assume you have it already downloaded and we'll go to the opening screen. As of the recording of this in 2021, in the latest version of Inkscape, the first time you open it up, you'll be greeted with this welcome screen on the quick setup tab. So for this tutorial and all my tutorials, I keep almost everything on the defaults. So canvas default, keyboard, Inkscape default, appearance, classic, symbolic. The only thing I change if you wanna follow along is I change the mode to dark mode for the theme. I just think it's easier on the eyes. I'll do save. That brings you to the supported by you tab, which is a reminder that Inkscape is free. It's a community made up of developers, designers, and people that put this all together. And there's a couple choices here. You can learn how to contribute your time or how to actually fund Inkscape. Just nice to have it there. And I hope this channel actually gives back to the community and, and your comments below and this dialogue that we can have and can just make it a better place. So let's go to the next tab, which is time to draw. And this new version of Inkscape gives you a whole bunch of different templates. If you're on the print tab right here, you're gonna have a whole bunch of choices which are just basically formats. It all goes to the same Inkscape with the same tools and everything. It'll just set up the guidelines based on whatever, whichever one you choose. You can have a US letter settings, eight and a half by 11 inches, like a regular page. You can get to business cards. You can do the regular sideways business card, vertical business card. If you go to screen, if you wanna make a project specifically for mobile phones, they have the settings here for that. Video, you can make overlays for your videos, social, they even have Facebook covers. You don't need to do a template like that, but in the very beginning, if you have a specific project, find the template for you and then just click on it. So let's go back to print. I'm gonna to go to some, the first one, just A4, which is in millimeters. And that will open up a blank Inkscape, a blank page here. This is the A4 default setting. And I have it zoomed down here at 50%. So if you wanna follow along with the exact settings, choose A4 and then size it based on your monitor so you can see the page. As we go through the tools, you can work anywhere on this whole area that's called the canvas. It's just at the very end, whatever project you're working on, having the page there helps when you actually export the file out of Inkscape so you can do something with it. Now I know the first couple times you open up Inkscape, it's almost like looking into the cockpit of a plane. There's just instruments everywhere. You've got all these hieroglyphics up here, all these menus, but we're gonna just stay focused on the basics and I'm gonna walk you through all the different tools and as you get more comfortable with Inkscape, you'll learn more of the fine tuning and, and pretty much open up your whole world. So don't be intimidated by it. As a beginner, let's just go over the basics. You ready? So let's grab the square right here. This is the Create Rectangles and Squares tool. If you hold the left mouse button down, you can draw out your first shape. Now, the Inkscape workflow gives us sidebar menus that lets us modify what you're working on. So let's click on this one here. This is the paintbrush thing in a corner. This is the fill and stroke menu. Fill is the internal color, stroke is the external perimeter. There's a couple ways you can actually change the colors. There's sliders here. I like the wheel. It's just visual and it's easy. So you can turn the wheel, changes your fill, or you can move around inside the triangle. To change the stroke, just click on the stroke paint tab. And then you can do the same thing. You can move inside the triangle or you can go around the perimeter. Let's keep it black for now for the easy contrast because I want to show you the stroke style. If you want to change the width of your stroke, you can manually type it in. Maybe we go to 10. We're on millimeters because of the template we chose was set to millimeters, which is fine. I like millimeters. Let's go back to 2.0. You can also get rid of the stroke if you want by clicking the black X here. Let's bring it back for a second. See this color ribbon in the bottom? This is a shortcut. Let's say you're moving quick, you don't have your menu open. If you click on any one of these color swatches, they will change the fill. If you hold shift and click on a color swatch, it will change the stroke. So it's a nice little shortcut. Also, see this red X right here. This eliminates whatever you're gonna choose. So if I click on the red X, it'll take out the fill. So click red X, no more fill. If I hold shift and click the red X, 
you get rid of the stroke. All right, so let's go over more of this menu. See this right here? Let's make sure we're on fill. If you drag this slider, it's gonna change the opacity of your object, the fill of the object. You can also do it down here. You can change this, you can manually type it in. And this is gonna come in handy when you're working on projects and you want the exact same transparency. But for now, let's go back to 100 and blur. You can just you can get carried away with blur, but we don't need that right now. Let's go back to our original shape. One of my absolute favorite settings on the fill and stroke menu is this one right here. It's called linear gradient. Click on that and the default brings up this bar. So on one side, you have a little square. On the other side, you have a little circle. If you click on this pencil thing, it's gonna let you modify your gradient. So if I click on the square, I can then choose, see that, I can change how my gradient works. And if I click on the other side, I can change where it goes. Now it's not looking that dramatic because remember the transparency? My other side of the gradient is on full transparency. But if I bring it back, you can then make some pretty cool things just from the very first menu we're playing with. Let's try this here. You can then move the different ends of your gradient. So if you wanna go vertical, you can bring it up here, bring it down. Let's say you wanted to add another stop in the gradient, double click anywhere on that, and then you can choose another, another color. So pretty powerful just for the first little box that we created. Before we move on, there's one more thing I wish I knew when I started about the squares and rectangles tool. There is a way to manually enter the exact dimensions, which will come in handy if you're on real specific projects later. If you're on either the selector or on the squares and rectangles tool itself, you see width and height, you can manually enter the exact dimensions you want. Now these are set to millimeters because that's based on the initial template that we used, but you can change it to inches, pixels, just stay with millimeters for now. So I can change the width to 200, maybe the height goes to 300. It's just one more thing that gives you a little bit more control. All right, let's move on to the next tool. So first, let's move this aside and let's grab the Create Circles and Ellipses tool. It works just like the squares and rectangles. So let's do a different application. First, if you hold Shift and Control together, that lets you draw out a perfect circle. If you wanna have more freedom, don't hold Shift, don't hold Control, and you can make ovals, any, any size, shape, ratio that you want. So in this example, we're gonna actually cut out the center of the circle and make almost like a badge logo where we put words on the top and the bottom. The first step is one of the most important shortcuts you're gonna use called duplicate. So if you have your object selected, do Control D, that's gonna duplicate it and it looks like nothing happened, but if you grab it, you'll see there's now two of them, which brings us to a very important thing up here in the menu, which is called hierarchy. It determines where it is in relation to other objects. So you see these like books with the arrows. If you want to have this object go behind that one, you'll push this one right here that has the down arrow down one step. So click that, it'll go behind it. Let's say you want this one to be on the bottom of everything. If you go all the way down to the bottom, click that one. Now it's behind everything. So that's going to be useful for just about everything that you do in Inkscape. So we needed to get that out of the way. So let's now minimize this. And how do we actually center it so it looks even and professional? Well, there's a menu for that. So right now we have fill and stroke menu. I'm gonna click another menu and it'll keep the fill and stroke tab there and add the next menu. So this one right here just looks like a bar graph that's called align and distribute. If I click that, there's a whole bunch of options, but the most important thing to, as you get used to using it you see how this part says align relative to? Let's go with last selected. Actually, before we do this, let's make it way off center so you can see what actually happens. So I'm gonna click off of everything. So the first selected will be the back one. If you hold shift and then the last selected will be the top one. Last selected, this one right here, it means center on the vertical axis. Click that and you've got the two centered up together. But how do I make it line up with the horizontal axis. It's this one right here. Click horizontal axis. And now it's perfectly centered. Let's get this out of the way. If you're working on just your page area, you can also make things centered based on the page. So watch this, Control D, duplicate, make this smaller. So you change relative to page, the object is selected, and then center on the vertical axis. Simple as that, goodbye. 
All right, so back to this. We're gonna now take out the center circle from the big circle. So let's grab both of them. Here's the top, hold shift, get the bottom. And while they're both selected, go up here to the path drop down menu and you wanna do difference. And the difference setting will actually pull out the area that's overlapped. And you're left with a new object that we can modify with the fill and stroke menu from before. So here's a line and distribute menu. I'm gonna go back to the fill and stroke menu. How come I don't see anything? Click on the object and that'll bring it back up. So let's go with more of a red fill, something like that. I'm not sure if I want the stroke. So again, the shortcut could be shift, hit the X or move it over to the stroke paint tab and exit out over there. So let's jump over to the create and edit text objects. Click on this A with the cursor next to it. I'm gonna write the word Inkscape. And before we actually put it into the circle, let's go over some of the ways you can adjust the text. It's one of my favorite features in Inkscape. You have a lot of ways you can manipulate fonts. So we have it set to Arial font, which everybody should have on their computer. Heavy is the style, 150 is the size. And if we want to make these letters spaced further apart, which sometimes helps when you're wrapping around a circle, over here, this part, the A and the A, this is how you can adjust the spacing or adjusting the current. So I'll do 50 and it widens it. Here's a tip. There might be a time where you want to make the font spaced very closely together. And there's a couple ways you can do that. So go back to the edit text. Let's start back to zero. So this is what it normally looks like by default. You can go negative on the current. So I'll do negative 10 and that brings everything close together. There's another modification you can do if you want to really have control over the spacing. If you click your cursor in between two particular letters, hold Alt, and you can use the arrow keys to either go wider or more narrow spacing between the individual letters, which is kind of cool for certain scenarios. You know, I actually discovered Inkscape because I was trying to make a logo with text wrapping around the top, so that's why I'm including it on the quick start here. Let's do it. So I'll grab the Create Circles tool, I'll hold Shift and Control. I have it set to no fill, just this stroke of a circle. I'll make it roughly the size of inside here. And this is just going to be a guideline. It's not going to be part of the logo. Let's use the font we have. It's probably too big. So we'll go to Edit. We'll make it 90 for the size and the spacing is way off. Let's go to 20. To set this up, we'll go back to the Align and Distribute menu. I have the text selected. I'll hold Shift. I've got my circle now. Relative to last selected, I'll center on the vertical axis. And there we go. Inkscape actually has a built-in feature that will put our text along a path of a circle. And it's called Text Put on Path. So click on Put on Path. It's actually upside down. So if you click off of everything, then just grab your text. Double clicking it, you'll get these handles. Any object that you double click gives you handles. And you can rotate it to the orientation that you want. And here we go. It's a little bit tight. I could change the font or change the spacing or the font weight. But the feature I really wanted to show you is this guide circle lets you continually change your arc. With the guide circle selected, I can make it bigger and it changes the curve or make it smaller. You just have a lot of control. So how do we put it down here? I backed up a couple steps. Most logos don't have the text upside down on the bottom. If we back up one more, we've got our text here, shift, get your guide circle text put on path and while you're at this stage go to object flip vertical well, now your text is on the interior of the circle click off of everything only grab your text and you can modify it so it fits nicely grab the guide circle widen that and you've got your text wrapped around the bottom I'll pause here for a moment because there's certain things as you're learning Inkscape that might frustrate you for example we just put the text where we want it and if you go to move your guide circle, it's going to mess up where your text is. If you delete the guide circle, it's going to revert back to a non-curve. An easy way to prevent that is another shortcut that you'll use all the time. So you've got your text selected, hold shift and get your circle. Go to object group. When it's grouped, it can be moved without the frustrations of your guide circle messing it up. The shortcut for group is control G. Moving on, the next tool I want to show you on the tour is the Create Stars and Polygons. So let's get rid of these items. You'll find the tool right here, the star with a pentagon. If I click on it, 
the modification settings pop up at the top and the default is going to be pentagon even though i have a star for the cursor so if i do left mouse button i can drag out a pentagon corners i can change it to eight there's my octagon nine nonagon let's go back to five rounded does just what you'd expect if i add plus here it's going to round the corners a bit now i can go back to zero or this little delete button thing click that and it goes back to the defaults randomized if you're still following along uh, try that type 5.0 and see what happens it's just it's going to mess up the whole screen and i'll you can let me know what happens in the comments if you do try that. So let's go on to the next one. Oh, see how I used the cursor and I lost my modification bar? If that ever happens to you, just go back to the original tool and it comes back up. So if I was on the polygon, I'll go to the actual star. So now if I do left mouse button, you'll see your star shape will come out. And the same with the pentagon, you can change the amount of points on your star. So we'll try eight. Spoke ratio will increase or decrease the amount of the center part of the star. Round it does the same thing and then just stay away from randomize for now. I've got one more thing to show you on the star. You see the delta at the tip of the point? If I'm on the shape tool, I can grab the tip and I can distort the star. I can rotate it, I can expand it, contract it. I can even go inverted on itself and make it almost like a kaleidoscope effect if I go right against it and do some pretty cool stuff. So basically, Hangscape gives you a lot of geometric firepower at your fingertips. Thank you, Star Tool. While we're showing off tricks, I'll go back to the Pentagon, and it doesn't have to be a Pentagon, it can be any shape. If I double click, I get the handles here, and you also notice this blue plus on the inside. That is the pivot point. So if I rotate, it's gonna rotate around the pivot point, but you can also take the pivot point outside of the shape so now it becomes a red plus and it's going to rotate around that you see so you can use that to your advantage for a whole bunch of different ways a simple visual we can do let's bring the pivot point in a little bit i'm going to hold the corner and rotate and i'm going to push the space bar as i do it so i'll do one click of the space bar and it stamps out every time you touch the space bar it's gonna give you another stamp of the object. And you've got a camera shutter or the beginnings of a floral motif or something like that. So let's go on to the next tool, which is not a beginner's tool, it's create 3D boxes. So we'll clear the space. Here's another trick. If you go in no man's land and hold the left mouse button, you can drag out a giant bounding box. And when you let go, it will select everything inside of that bounding box. So then you can then push delete, clear the space. So let's center this up. The 3D tool defaults to whatever your page is at. So you wanna to get to a view, I'm on 50%, where the original guidelines are showing because the Create 3D Boxes tool uses that in its reference points. I'm gonna hold the left mouse button down and drag out my first box. There you go. So one reference point there, there's an anchor point there, and the top is going into infinity. If you look up here in the modification area, the Y axis is set to parallel. This is the, the default. So it's going to an infinite point. If I unclick that, it'll go to a vanishing point. We'll just put it back to the default. You see this X right here? This lets me move around spatially in relation to all these points, and all of these diamonds are anchor points to the actual shape. So you can play around with it, you can make whatever you whatever you feel like making. I'm actually doing a tutorial from a special request. Someone wants to see an exploded version of a turntable. So just a taste of that. I have this object selected. I'll do Control D, we'll duplicate it. If I grab the X, I can bring that up. Control D duplicates that, I can move it over. I can thin that one out and you get the picture. There's probably more specific software if you're doing 3D diagrams, but Inkscape has this if you want it. Grab in the middle of nowhere, delete. This next tool is a bit of an unsung hero in Inkscape. I don't use it a whole lot personally, but it does have some cool effects we can play with. I'll click the Create Spirals tool and I'll draw open the spiral. It looks pretty plain. Up here in the modification area, I can change the amount of turns. Let's choose 25 gets a little bit more interesting. Also, so I can have some more contrast or at least weight to the line, I'll go back to my fill and stroke menu 
and on stroke style, I'll go to 1.0. And then I've got a little bit of hypnotic effect happening. I'm not sure if you can see it. If you're doing this at home, you'll see it on your computer. From here, let's go back to the tool, the modification settings. If I increase the divergence number, it'll look more like a natural spiral, like a seashell. So it's at 1.0, I'll go to 6.0, and you've got that seashell natural spiral. And inversely, if I go to a much lower number, like 0.25, it'll look unnatural, almost like a sci-fi effect. I'll grab the center delta and get that out of the way. And you've got, I've got a plenty of hypnotic motion on the side here. Not sure what that term is, but it's happening. And that is some of the things you can do with the spiral tool. If you don't like what you just did, always go back to the delete tab and take you back to the default. Now we'll move from one of the least used to one of the most used tools in Inkscape. It's the Bezier pen tool. I have a complete tutorial on this. I'll have a link in the description below if you want to go more in depth. But for now, let's at least go over the basics. A key thing to remember if this is the first time you're trying Bezier pen, and it's even shown in the icon itself, you're going to be making lines or shapes using points or what Inkscape calls nodes. And then you can take those nodes and manipulate things at will. So let me show you the most basic Bezier pen thing we can do. So I've got Bezier pen selected. Up here in the modification area, I'll be on create regular Bezier path. I'll click the left mouse button once and let go. And it made a red node. I'll draw it out anywhere I want. And if I double click, it completes my line. So where do my nodes go? This thing right here, this is called edit paths by node. I'll click on that. And you can see my starting node, I can now move this anywhere, and my ending node goes right there. So that's the simplest way you can do it. You'll also notice it adopts whatever color you have on your fill and stroke menu. So there is no fill because it's just a line, but for stroke, I can change it if I go to stroke paint to any color that you imagine. So we'll go to a green, just because it's gonna lead us into the next exercise. So that's the most basic line. Now, how do you draw a shape? Go back to your Bezier pen tool. I'm on regular path. This time I'll just click and let go. There's one point, click and let go, click and let go. And if I want to complete the shape, when I hover over the original node, it'll turn red. Just click again, kind of clashing colors. Let's change the fill on this to a reddish pink. And while we're at it, I'm going to make it slightly transparent. Let's move that out of the way. And now for the Bezier curve. So we'll start back again. We're on the regular Bezier path. This time I'm going to click the left mouse button and hold. So when I drag it out, see that circle? That means I'm about to drop a curve. If I let go, the curve appears in a red line. So when I double click, it will complete the shape again, adopting the fill and stroke that we had. If I want to modify it back to edit paths by node, I can pull the line part and change it that way. Or if I click on a node itself, I should get handles and handles also let you change the arc and shape pretty much any way that you feel like. I'm going to do one more type of Bezier pen for you. This time go to create B spline path. What this does is it's going to round all the points. Even if I try to make a hard triangle like that, it's going to round it for me. And that's going to be most useful in this exercise. A very common thing that people want to do when they jump onto Inkscape is remove the background out of an image. Let's do that right now. So I'm going to bring in an image. I'll have a link in the description. This is an open source image from Pexels and it's a, whoop, you got the menu here. So we're going to bring everything in the defaults, push OK. It's a dolphin. <laughs> so how do we get this dolphin out of the water and just have its beautiful self with no background? Well, we can do that with the Bezier pen. Let me zoom out for you. For simplicity, I'm going to be on the B spline. And the reason I had the fill be transparent is so I can see where I'm going. Maybe I zoomed out too much. All I'm going to do is create my line around the part of the image that I want to extract. And you don't have to do it all in one go. If I end that part of the path and I wanted to take a break, take my hand off the mouse, stretch out, you can still go back to where you were by hovering over the node and keep going. Now you see why the B spline is good for an example like this, because it keeps everything on a curve. Okay, we're getting there. I'm going to jump ahead and have this whole thing highlighted. 
Through the magic of editing, our Bezier pen path is complete, outlining our dolphin friend here. I do have a complete tutorial on how to remove background, and I'll put that video link in the description below. But for now, on day one, if you want to clip this out, what you do is you go back to Selector Tool. If you have the Dolphin Bezier Pen outline selected already, hold Shift and get the rest of the image. Go to Object, Clip, Set. <laughs> There's your dolphin. Simple. Next up is Pencil Tool with the formal name of Draw Freehand Lines. Let's grab No Man's Land, draw a bounding box around everything, delete and might as well move back to our 50% zoom to give us all a similar frame of reference. Pencil is one of the more intuitive tools until it isn't. I have it selected for fill, nothing, stroke, 2.0 millimeters with the black color. I'll hold the left mouse button down and draw a line. Just like you'd expect, what you draw is what you get. Up here, you'll see smoothing. I'm gonna draw a squiggly line and it comes out, what you draw is what you get. But if I change the smoothing to something of a higher number, like 70, it flattens a lot of it out. It takes out some of the jitter. It also works in real time. So I'm gonna draw something messy and you get something more smooth. So one of the applications you might use this for is if you're doing a signature logo or some type of design where you want it to look more elegant, you get this. So that is with the 70% smoothing. And if I take it back down to the default of 15, you get a mess. So 70 works in this case. Let's check out a couple more features here. We were on shape none this whole time. I'm gonna change it to triangle in. If I hold down the left mouse button and draw, it's gonna look like the pencil is starting with a triangle that tapers off into nothing. If I go to triangle out, same thing, just reversed. It goes from tapered barely there to a full stroke. And here's where things get less intuitive. There's a choice called from clipboard. Remember our tool here? Let's draw a star. I'm gonna go control C, which copies it, or you can do edit copy. That puts that star on the clipboard. If I go back to pencil and I'm choosing from clipboard, I can draw a little line and it gives me the star. If you stretch the line longer, your star is stretched longer. If you warp it, your star is warped. Who would have thought? Something I do use with pencil on occasion, if you hold control and do one mouse click, you get a dot. That's day one with the pencil. Let's move on to its cousin, draw calligraphic or brush strokes. I cleared the canvas and I set this up because this is a tool I use all the time, but it's a little bit confusing at first because you have all these presets, dip pen, marker, brush, wiggly, splotch, but in actuality, it's all the same thing. It's just changing the modifications for you. And when you're working in Inkscape, making a project, the second you make a change, it's gonna to go to no preset and it's confusing. What happened to my dip pen? It doesn't matter. So if you understand the modifications, you'll get to know what works best for you. You can actually save it. But these are the defaults. Dip pen, I'll draw on this side. Actually, key point also, the way I like to work with the draw calligraphic tool is I keep it on a fill and I turn the stroke off. So my stroke is off my fill change it to something red for this example. So there's your dip pen, it's like an old timey quill. Marker, just like you'd expect, looks like a kid marker. Brush, let's use this one as an example to show you the modifications. With self-explanatory, I've got 5.0 set to millimeters. This down arrow in the hill, this is if you're actually using a tablet or a digital pen or some type of stylus, it'll take into account the pressure you're putting. I'm just using a mouse so it doesn't apply. Thinning takes into account the speed that you're moving the mouse. Let's go to a positive 30 and I'll show you what I mean. I'll start moving the mouse slowly and make a thick line. And if I go quickly, it thins out. And as I slow down, it got thick again. Mass, that's gonna take into account as if you have like a heavier pen in your hand. And the rest, this is a little more advanced except for wiggle. <laughs> Let's make wiggle higher and you'll see it's a lot more sensitive to any shake. I use that a lot. Finally, to prove my point, since we were making changes to the modification, even though we started with brush, we tripped over to no preset. So don't worry about that. You can always change it back or save the setting that you like best. To drive the point home, let's go to the wiggly preset and it's already starting at 50 for the wiggle. We'll end the tool exploration with splotch. Somehow it defaulted to 100 width. Let's take it back down to five millimeters and see what it changes to. 
right there. Splotch I use all the time making clouds and things because I like the randomness of it and when you blur it out it gives an organic feel. And that is the draw calligraphic or brush strokes tool. Clear the canvas again. We already did the edit text tool and that brings us to the create and edit gradients. This works as a nice shortcut if you have an object that's there and rather than go to the fill and stroke menu and select linear gradient here, you can click the create and edit gradients tool and directly line up your gradient bar. And just like before, you can then edit either side. So right now I have the circle selected, which is full transparency. I can take it out of transparency. I can change the color. Whatever you need to do, you can do. If you wanna work with something more challenging and need a more powerful gradient, the next tool is create and edit meshes. So let's get rid of this. I'm gonna draw a new rectangle example. If I select create and edit meshes, I can drag anywhere on my object and I'm gonna get a grid. Up here in the settings, we want new create mesh gradient. We'll affect the fill for rows one, columns two. You can play with these, but just for an example to see how it works, We'll go with this. You're familiar with the linear gradient bar here and this delta at the bottom means we can select it and change the color to something maybe red, almost like a heat map here. But unlike the entry level tool, this model lets us bend the line. So I'll bend it out here. Here's another delta, which means I can change this. Maybe we go to something blue or green. That's kind of interesting. Basically, the mesh gradient allows you a lot more freedom to change the way the gradient plays inside the space. Moving on from one of the more complicated tools to one of the simplest, let's choose Eyedropper. Eyedropper is a color picker. It's been hiding on the fill and stroke menu right here, and it does just what you think. If I have this object selected with the black fill, I'll choose the color picker Eyedropper, and whatever color I hover over, that will change the fill on the selected object. Simple. So how do you use it in something more interesting than that? Let's say you want to get a color palette based on this beautiful image from Pexels. I got the link in the description below. I'll start by selecting this box with a black fill. We'll choose the color picker and we'll go to one of the darker colors in the image. I'm gonna sneak in an important feature to Inkscape while we're working on this simple tool here. It's called snapping. Snapping lets you connect two objects based on the nodes. So watch how it works. I've got this box selected. Control D will duplicate it. And because over here snapping is enabled, when I move it close to this object, it's gonna try to connect it. And that's very helpful because I wanna make a color palette where they're all lined up together. If I take snapping off, then I can still move it there, but it's not gonna connect automatically. A lot of times when you're working on a project that's more artistic, you might take snapping off on purpose because you don't wanna have something automatically connect and take away your control of movement. For my paint swatch color strip, I do want snapping on. It's this magnet thing with the electricity between it. Click there and it should snap right in place. Control D, snap, control D. All right, so back to color picker. I've got the top one, the color I want it to be. I'll select this one, color picker. Let's go a little bit lighter. Select this one, maybe in the shallow here. Select this one, some white water, wet sand, and dry sand. And that simple tool gives us something we can use in complex projects. That brings us to paint bucket, which should be called jar of confusion. It's the reason I titled this the unauthorized Inkscape quick start, but in an effort to be complete with the tool rundown, let me show you what it does. Let's just stick with the basics for now. Up in the modification area, I've got fill by visible colors, threshold 15, grow shrink zero, close gaps none. The default preference is it's gonna use whatever styles you last used. So the last thing I drew before you came to this screen was this yellow circle with the black stroke. I'm on my paint bucket. I'm gonna go on top of this text A and it made a vector of the A, which you can then go to edit paths by node and play around with. Keeping in mind, it's gonna use the last style selected. If I change this object and I drop out the fill and just have the outline, now my paint bucket will just do an outline. Creating outlines could be useful if you're making coloring books or if you're gonna cut something out in the physical world using an Inkscape file. It also has some tracing properties. If I wanna extract the black 
oil part, or whatever this is, soap or oil, I'll go to my paint bucket. The last style used was the black stroke with no fill. I'll click on the black and we got this interesting abstract. We can modify it over here. I'll go back to a fill, give it an interesting color there, maybe change the stroke to something lighter and you can have fun with it. One more paint bucket trick. If you have two random objects like this, if you wanna create a new vector of just this part here that's showing underneath, grab the paint bucket. It's gonna look something like this because that's the last selected style and you've got a shape that you generated off of an overlap. So mind blown, right? <laughs> Let's go to tweak objects and sculpting. I brought in our beach color palette to show you how the tool works. And first things first, we need snapping off. So don't have snapping enabled because the whole point with tweak and sculpt is we're gonna move things around. And if it's trying to connect, it won't work. Here's the tool right here. It looks like this wave. I click on that. The defaults are five for the width, force 30. That's the amount of power going behind it. And there's a bunch of different choices. I'll show you four of them. The first mode, is move objects in any direction. So I'm gonna select this palette right there, go back to my tweak, and if I hold down the mouse, it'll move the pieces around. There's different versions of that if you wanna move it towards your cursor, if you shrink everything in, and you have rotate. Could be pretty cool if you're doing some modern geometric art. The last setting is a blur feature. If I hold down the mouse button, it'll blur based on how long I hold it down. If you hold shift, it'll unblur it. So you can have fun with that if you wanna to try to pull focus on parts of your work. If you weren't loving the color palette, there's actually a jitter the colors feature. And when I hold down the mouse, it'll change the colors. Not sure if that's any better. And the last one I'll show you is this bump right there. This is the sculpt feature. Let's change the force to something a little larger, 80. And that will let you pull pieces and warp them any direction you want. One tool with very different applications. Let's go and do spray can. I made a test area so I can show you how it works. Basically, spray tool is gonna shoot out whatever object we have selected. This little dot is gonna be a star, and this rectangle is gonna be the blank night sky. So I have my object selected. I choose the tool. For mode, we're up in spray copies of the initial selection. Width is five, mount 15. That's roughly how many come out when you shoot it. Scale, that varies the size between each one of them. Scatter, how much it goes everywhere. And focus represents this orange circle. All I need to do is hold the left mouse button down and draw some stars or polka dots on a rectangle. Either way, you get the idea. Let's do another example that might be easier to see. This time I'll choose this double triangle, just some line art. Go back to my spray tool. I'm not gonna change any of the settings. And when I hold the left mouse button down, I get this. You can move it around and get a geometric pattern there. I do wanna make an important distinction. On the mode, you have spray copies, which is what we've been doing, and you also have spray clones. What is the difference? It's gonna look the same. If I have this selected with spray copy mode, it sprays it out. And if I choose the triangle, but I change it to spray clones, what is the difference? The difference between a copy and a clone. This circle was copied. If I now change the circle, nothing happens. These triangles are all clones. If I change the clone, they all change. And that can be very useful down the line. Perfect timing right now for the next tool, which is Eraser. It's this icon right here. It will give us three choices. The first mode is delete objects touched by Eraser. So if I draw this red line, anything it touches is gone. If there's an object you don't want, just draw on top of it, it's gone. Gone, gone, the whole night sky is gone. <laughs> this whole line up right there, gone. But wait, there's more. If we choose the second mode, which is called cut out from paths and shapes, you can draw against some type of shape and it's gonna create new objects in its place. And they become independent, so you can take them apart and have fun with that. The third mode is called clip from objects and it works more like a traditional eraser. If you have the object selected, whatever you draw is totally removed. So you can do zigzags, back of the pencil eraser. Up here you can change it so it's actually a wider eraser and it even works on images. Just make sure you select it first, then go back to your eraser tool and let's say there was some uh, trash right there. It's gone. So far, every tool has earned their spot on the toolbar here, except maybe this next one. It's called Create Diagram Connectors. 
you're going to make a quiz of some sort and you want to connect the question to the two yes or no answers or any type of chart you want to create, there's a tool for you. I have all the defaults, I haven't changed the thing. And if I hover over the box and draw it to the other box and let go, it creates a line. Same thing for the other. Moving on. Hey, if you're still watching this, I really do appreciate it. I wanted to make this accessible to first time users, beginners, intermediates, and even throw some tricks in there that maybe you haven't seen before. I do love Inkscape and I wanna make this channel grow and have a community where we can all help each other. All right, let's do the last tool. It is actually a good one. It's called Do Geometric Constructions. What I have here is a simple rectangle and we're gonna use the mirror symmetry function of this tool to turn this into a shield. First, with the object selected, go to Path, Object to Path. That's gonna allow us to do the Edit Paths by Node, which we'll need. Go to the Tool. Don't worry about all the different choices, just choose this one here that's called Mirror Symmetry. What that did is it duplicates it, and now if I do Edit Paths by Node, anything I do is done to both sides. So to round my shield, I have this one node selected, I'll delete it, makes it a triangle momentarily, but then I can drag out the shape that I want. Use the handles if you want. Once you have the proportions the way you like it, grab everything, go to Path Union, and you have one object as a shield. <laughs> and that'll do it. Thanks so much for watching. If you have any ideas or questions or comments, put them down below. I would recommend, there's two tutorials on Trace Bitmap. That's the only thing I didn't include in this that I would absolutely try out if you're new to Inkscape. So have fun with it, and thanks.